The last bookstore in Laredo, Texas has gone out of business. Just one more event in an alarming trend. What does this mean for that community? Or the next one? Or one day, even ours? How is this change impacting the bookselling industry and our exposure to new or unique products? And are our literary choices being altered or limited? Tonight we ask, where have all the bookstores gone, and what does this mean for our future? I'm Ernie Manus, and this is Houston 8. On January 16th, the only remaining bookstore in the city of Laredo, Texas, closed its doors, leaving that city of a quarter million people without a bookstore. That makes Laredo the largest U.S. city without a book retailer. In the age of Amazon and online shopping, bookstores across the country have been shutting down. Many retailers have tried to reinvent themselves as community centers by adding free Wi-Fi, coffee bars, special events, and even live entertainment. But when given the choice of shopping in a store or saving a few bucks by ordering online, brick-and-mortar booksellers are disappearing at an alarming rate. Reminiscent of the Walmart growth wave of the 1990s that wiped out many mom-and-pop retailers, the Internet revolution is now going after the remaining stores and chains. Schools and public libraries are trying to pick up the slack by incorporating new concepts and design into their facilities, But is that enough? As the business world around us works to improve its bottom line, what is happening to our exposure to the literary world? Joining us tonight are Tony Diaz, novelist and president of Nuestra Palabra, Naomi Reynolds, general manager, Books A Million Bookstore, and Dr. Rhea Brown Lawson, director, Houston Public Library. Representatives of Barnes & Noble, owner of Laredo's B. Dalton Bookstore, were invited to join us for this discussion, but declined our invitation. But I welcome all of you here. Thank you. The first question is, how is this alarming us? A store went out of business. Why should we be concerned? I'm going to start with you, Dr. Lawson. Well, anytime um, access to publications is uh, leaves a community, it's, it's, we should be concerned, especially in a community where children have an opportunity to own their own books. Mm-hmm. We provide an opportunity for them to borrow books, but it's something to be said about having books in the home and having um, a, a, the presence of books in the homes that are owned. One of the criticisms that folks have been making about the Laredo situation is that it is giving the symbol that because it's a predominantly Spanish-speaking community, books aren't important, and that's why they've closed their store. Tony, what are your feelings? You know what? This is kind of the manifestation which has been going on for a long time. For example, this is tragic. Um, while we are promoting a book called Echo en Tejas, an anthology of Texas Mexican writers, we took the show on the road and did like barn-burning readings because there wasn't anything to service the South Texas Valley. This is a daunting figure for Laredo. In South Texas, which is about as wide a stretch as driving from here to Austin, in 2007 there was one bookstore in McAllen to service three counties, one million people. I guess there's two bookstores now, so they've doubled it. (laughs) But time and time again, what happens with these bookstores is if you have a TV and you have a Nielsen box, you know that somehow Mm -hmm. someone's monitoring what you watch, and that will dictate the programming. It's the same things with these bookstores. And the problem is they don't know how to measure us. They don't know how to count us. Because even to, here in Houston, trying to get an anthology, a book of Mexican-American writers is still hard. So mm-hmm. I think what's happened is the chickens have come home to roost. And they've these major bookstores, who are super vital, have been trying to do a wide, 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 wide audience. And the niches now are going to be super important. And our niche has been overlooked time and time again. We d- This proved that we are very interested in reading, we're not being serviced to, but we're used to it. So now our community needs to step up and say, Mm -hmm. we need that bookstore, we need the library, we need all of it. I want to point out one thing, too, that we came across in our research, that because this store closed, this B. Dalton in Laredo closed, a lot of folks are assuming it's because people didn't support the bookstore. Mm -hmm. But what we have heard was that it was a profitable store, that it wasn't closed because nobody cared. 
It was closed because of a corporate decision. Now, unfortunately, Naomi, you get to represent corporate booksellers <laughs> here today. But there's a lot you folks do do to try and encourage community yeah. interaction. Yeah, it's sort of like uh, what Dr. Lawson said. Um, I have grandkids. They love the public library. They love to go read. They love the activities. But when my granddaughter comes home, she doesn't want to take that book back. She mm -hmm. wants to own mm -hmm. that book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's a good position for us because reading is fundamental. It really is. And what Tony was saying about meeting the niches, uh, we have an entire Hispanic section mm -hmm. with all the novels. Anything you can get in English, you can get in Spanish in our store. So we are trying to cater to that. And I think the other piece is we do have to go out of the brick and mortar mm -hmm. uh, into the community. Mm -hmm. So we can't sit there waiting for the people to come to the mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. We have to go out into the community. Mm -hmm. And if you're sitting in the store, then you're not really servicing the community. But should we be alarmed? Okay, so a corporate decision was made that a particular chain of bookstores was no longer mm -hmm. pulling its own weight, so they closed it. Why should this or shouldn't this be a public outcry? Yeah. I would, yeah. <laughs> well, Tony, I'll, I'll toss it to you then. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, for every novelist out there, this is exactly where you want to be sitting. The uh -huh. major bookstore, uh -huh. major library. library. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, we already put together some I know, we've got a few events. We've just <laughs> revolutionized yeah. the way books will get to, yeah. to the people. Yeah. No, what's happening is that it's the same thing. Sometimes people think, well, you know, you're just supporting what Latino readers, writers think. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're from Texas and you read books in New York, they think we're a minority. Mm -hmm. So in New York, where these corporate decisions are being made, except by, you know, folks like us here in the trenches, we know what's going on here, and they don't know what's going on in New York. The publishing world doesn't know what's going on in New York. If we say Hispanic writers in New York, they're thinking a certain type of writer, it might be Cubano, Boricua, which is fine. They don't know what Mexican American writers are really about. So, mm -hmm. what, what the problem is, their little conduit, the little radar, said whatever readings, they're making money. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, Borders is, is bleeding money right and left. Um, I read a, something in Publishers Weekly that small bookstores are getting um, bankruptcy lawyers to talk to bar Borders because they're paying so late. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. here's a store making money. Right. And that can dictate how books are shaped to the communities we know are ignored. This, this is a major outcry because the one, well, the one thing they might listen to is money, but they've ignored that. Naomi? Well, mm -hmm. I, I would say that from a corporate standpoint, uh, you have to take into consideration profit and loss and expenses. Um, certainly the expense line is critical uh, if you have high rents, if you have high utilities and all of that's going up for the bookstores and the companies, the corporations just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier if you own rather than leasing property. Um, so if you own that piece of property, then you're more likely to be profitable. Um, most of the bookstores and corporations mm -hmm. are going into uh, the malls mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. because they got a captured audience in the malls. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is funny because B. Dalton was primarily a mall chain, was it? and Borders decided that, or I mean, Barnes and Noble decided, decided that was the down. chain they had to shut down. It's mm -hmm. interesting. I've got a little timeline here, and we'll get through different pieces of it. But in the timeline, in 1991, there were 5,200 bookstores in America. Mm -hmm. In 2005, 14 years later, there were only 1,700 bookstores in America, and I can't even imagine what the number would be today. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Lawson, you made a very interesting point before we even came mm -hmm. on air today about the relationship between bookstores and libraries. Because a lot of people mm -hmm. think you guys are at odds with each other, mm -hmm. but you're not. Oh, we're not. Um, often, um, as um, Naomi just said, while you were doing the promo, we were putting our heads together about how we were going to get Tony. She'd bring the books and we'd do the program. Mm -hmm. So we often partner with bookstores, and we don't see them as competition. We see them as partners because book. the thing about people who love books. They love to own books and they love anywhere books are. So they usually are both people who go to bookstores mm -hmm. and people who frequent mm -hmm. public libraries. The thing, the impact on libraries when a bookstore closes is that we see more people mm -hmm. and um, our numbers go up. 
And we see that even more, uh, the impact of the current economy, when people have to make decisions about whether they can afford books. Yeah. And they say, well, maybe I can just borrow it. Mm -hmm. And so we see our numbers go up in that way. Yeah. A challenge that I read somewhere in all of this was that public libraries can't really supply the popular fiction mm -hmm. as easily as bookstores. That's what I was but you can say. have a much fuller back catalog that can yes. help. Yeah. Yes, if we don't have the most current, we usually have the, 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 you know, we can say, have you read, or we have something <laughs> similar. Mm -hmm. But we don't buy the, or cannot afford to buy the best sellers in the volume that bookstores mm -hmm. do. You go into bookstores and you see displays of uh, 20, 30 of the same title in one location. Houston Public Library has 41 locations, so mm -hmm. we have to buy uh, these popular books for all of our locations. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and, and the budgets are what the budgets are, mm -hmm. so we have to make uh, mm -hmm. decisions about what else is needed, children's books, popular is it, books. I want to go to you, Diane, is yeah. it a little misleading when we walk into one of your stores, any, mm -hmm. and by yours I mean those mega Anybody, book stores, yeah. And you see so much, and you get the idea, wow, they have everything here. But actually, there is a limit to what you have. There is There's a limit. very much, somebody is deciding what goes on those shelves. But yes, there's a limit, and there's a cost to publishers to place their books in stores. So it's sort of like uh, Walmart or anybody else, you do pay placement fees in some of the bookstores to be in the front, front. Uh, mm -hmm. to be right there in what mm -hmm. we call the landing zone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How much so, you need? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, John. Uh, but Dr. Lawson was right, but we see a lot of people in the community that come in and, I mean, w w if you want to browse and you want to sit and read a book, we don't fuss about that, you know, uh, because... Um, they'll go to the library and they're looking for a book and it's a popular book and they'll wait for the most part. They'll, they'll try and wait until it comes back mm -hmm. to the library and then when they finally come in the store they say, well, it's a long list for that book. I'm going to go ahead on and buy it now. Mm -hmm. you know, so um, um, it's, it's, it's a twofold uh, thing between us and the library. We have a lot of it and again, like you said, we don't carry everything. Uh, technical books and a lot of the school books. Uh, however, we work with the school districts to order in advance so we mm -hmm. can have what they need. Mm -hmm. So it's about advance planning as Dr. Mm -hmm. Lawson and I talked about mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, I know that the summer reading list will be out soon. It's mm -hmm. my job to order all the books that I know the kids will be looking for for their summer reading list mm -hmm. uh, for their parents to buy for them. So we, we buy them uh, so that they can borrow so them. So that they can borrow them. <laughs> right. And what if it was books two million? Would that be enough to cover? Them? <laughs> <laughs> like books a trillion. Books and a trillion. then maybe it's all covered. When we talk about selection, though, and, of course, the elephant in the room is the online world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. folks think but everything's there. We all know the popular website, Amazon, so I don't yeah. feel that we're doing a commercial by mentioning <laughs> no, their no, name. No, no, but we do it have is, booksamillion.com. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it <laughs> is the largest online retailer, yeah. bar none. The next one is a third behind them in retail mm -hmm. when you get to number two in this list of them. Mm -hmm. So Amazon really does have a stronghold on this marketplace. Yeah, and pretty much, and I might be wrong, but my assumption is any book out there I can find on Amazon. Mm. How then do you compete in a brick-and-mortar business saying anyone can find anything in the world with a click of a button? What do I offer? We mm. look for loyalty. Um, we have our different programs to cater to membership, loyalty, uh, special uh, deals that we offer, memberships. Um, so it comes down to more loyalty in that area, and a lot of people are loyal to Amazon. Like you said earlier, Amazon came first. So there's a loyalty there mm -hmm. uh, for those customers. So we work towards loyalty, and we're starting to build that loyalty. Um, so, and the other things we do, we bring in other items. I mean, you don't make a lot of money on books. 
so you have to bring in other pieces, the gifts, the, the non-book items, the gifts, the electronics that we were talking about earlier. And that's something that I wonder about because I think the assumption by most people is look at what the bookstores have done to make this more important. Mm -hmm. So if I'm coming for a book, I can get other things here. Not realizing it's the profit margin that encouraged yes. mm -hmm. these other items being in bookstores yes. mm -hmm. because the profit on a book isn't as that's great. Right. Yeah. And so if you can sell a pen or a piece of chocolate mm -hmm. or a glass, a cup of coffee, coffee. it's yeah. going to help your profit you, margin. You know what I'd like to add to that? One message for readers and one message for writers. It's similar to movies where if there's a blockbuster film, you know there's going to be copycats. Mm -hmm. For a bestseller, by the time the book hits the shelves, there's a machine that's six months out. My particular community doesn't have access to that or, or my writers don't know they have to be in on that. Mm -hmm. So that when the first couple of weeks that the book's out, all the major chains, you know, book scan says, here's how many books sold. Here's how many people bought this book. They look at your community. Amazon kind of skews that because they're like, well, here's this, you mm -hmm. know, nationwide, international wide thing. So for us to service our community, we've got to go out just like to support those films, support those books. First couple of weeks out. On the flip side, too, for our writers out there, I, I've got a new word that we're, we're using. It's called, you've got to be a libro traficante. Now, it's not, you just can't sit back. Uh, you've got to actually be deeply involved in helping these two brilliant folks get their job done and saying, you know what, we're going to make a cool event. But as an author, store. don't you really, wouldn't you rather have the bookseller behind you than the library? How do you decide, you know, where does your effort go? Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah. You know what? <laughs> you know what? Uh, the the classic days. You know, if I was Hemingway, I'd just be running with the bulls or something mm, like that, yeah. and just writing. Um, nowadays, we need both because, mm. but but it's the symbiosis and the cultural credibility is that at some point when the next writer pushes me off <laughs> the end cap, there's still a lot there's of my books at the library yeah. next yeah. to the other giants of. Mm -hmm of literature so it's this and I think with, without that a city just looks bad I mean it's just like you know if you were sleeping at night and someone pulled your brain out of your head you know yeah. I mean, oh, man. That, well <laughs> and we mentioned just a second ago too the, the corporate entity mm -hmm. that are booksellers and how book publishers work with booksellers to get them mm -hmm. and to pay to get to the right locations and all of that I come out of a background in library science mm -hmm. and in there mm -hmm. There's a whole different criteria of how you're picking what you're putting in your stores. Yes, you're being courted, too, especially mm -hmm. when you're the Houston Public mm -hmm. Library because you're mm -hmm. pretty big. But explain to our audience a little bit about how you decide what goes on your shelves because your shelves, that book's going to sit there for a lifetime mm -hmm. as opposed to you're going to mm -hmm. change your stock mm -hmm. back and back. Well, we look at um, past history. We look at uh, the promos, um, popular authors, new authors. We read the reviews, and we know our customers. Mm -hmm. And so we put a formula together that says what would be big in different areas of town because every community is different and with 41 locations mm -hmm. a bestseller may not mean anything you know they may need a books on how to get a GED or they may need books on um, how to write a resume that's more important than that latest bestseller and not to confuse anybody mm -hmm. who's watching that the public library you can find miles of fiction too oh you you've can. got you've got every Everything there right. and movies right. and music. That's right. And now even the public libraries are putting in cafes. We have and cafes and we have programs. We have live uh, programs in the uh, middle of the the library floor. We have exhibits. Uh, we have world languages uh, and the largest mm. provider of internet connectivity in the city. Mm -hmm. Public libraries claim that all around the country. Um, in these economic times, people have to make decisions about whether or not they're going to keep their internet connectivity. And you talk about buying on Amazon, there's an assumption there that everybody can go to their computer. Everybody mm -hmm. can't go to their computer and they depend on us. Every time uh, a library door opens, a public library door opens, there are lines of people waiting to just use the computer. Mm -hmm. We walk around with devices and we can go to mm. our offices and our homes and many people, believe it or not, just have an hour or two a day, maybe a couple of times a week, uh, connected. 
So there's still room for yeah. bookstores. There's yeah. still a need for libraries because I, you touch on yes. something that gets me going all the time. Mm-hmm. People talking about when we go to literacy now, mm-hmm. you know, people aren't reading anymore. They mm-hmm. just don't read. And yet I think actually we read a whole lot more in our everyday mm-hmm. life. Yes, it's not the in-depth reading mm-hmm. of novels or stories and all of that, but it is reading to do anything online, on computer. You're oh, reading you're volume right. and volumes of stuff. Oh, we're overload. We're an information overload. So what happens if you're in a community now and you can't read? Mm-hmm. Literacy today is an even bigger problem, I would say, than 20 years ago. It is because there's an assumption that uh, you can read uh, and and there's more self-service. You go to the grocery store, it's self-service. You come to the library, it's self-service. And go to the gas station, it's self-service. So you have to know how to read. Mm -hmm. And the assumption out there is that people will do this and they can do this well. Well, we know that um, Mm -hmm. at least 40%, upwards of 50% of communities are functionally illiterate. Mm -hmm. The library's role in that is to provide space for literacy providers Mm -hmm. to have tutorial programs and to purchase uh, uh, materials that um, tutorials, tutor relationships can use in teaching Mm -hmm. people how to read. Let's build out a little bit from that point Mm -hmm. and say, okay, so you have libraries and you have schools, and those are supposed to be our primary attacks on the lack of literacy in this country. But what does it mean when a bookstore goes out of business? When when a community like Laredo no Mm -hmm. longer has a bookstore, how does that impact literacy? You know what, too, even following up on what you're saying, this digital divide is about to get even mm-hmm. more expensive. Yeah, even we're going to hit that expensive. in a minute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like we're alive during the Industrial Revolution where our roles are completely changed. Mm-hmm. So e- even as artists now, we don't know what's going to be the delivery system for books. I, I, and mm-hmm. what exists now, I think we're going to talk about a little bit like Kindles, etc. I'm not thrilled by those yet just because they're derivatives of the art. We don't have people creating exactly for that. Because even right now, I mean, the art must fit the genre. I mean, imagine, you know, the Ten Commandments had to be on tablets of stone. Ten Commandments on the disc could be like, you know, you got room for thousands more commandments. You know? <laughs> I don't think that's what limited God's law. <laughs> yeah, but. You know, like, yeah. well, but, but not quite yet has the art hit the delivery form, hit that format. Right. When it does, you know, maybe it'll be obvious what to do. But in the course of that, we don't know what's going on, but we still have to do business, business as normal right. and proceed well, but, forward. And as we're saying about the new electronic devices, mm-hmm. of course, everyone knows this week iPad was mm-hmm. mentioned, the new i from Apple, their new device yeah. for mm-hmm. it's a laptop, but it's a reader, mm-hmm. but it's this and that, so it's multifunctional. I understand Borders now has decided who they are partnering with with their mm-hmm. reader, which will be different than the Kindle, which is Amazon's reader. So you do have this fragmented mm-hmm. community of who's going to do what. What does all of this do to bookstores then? Well, we'll have our reader, too. So, you know. <laughs> so you're, you're jumping on that, too. We're, yeah, we, we had one um, that we, we, the e-reader last year that mm-hmm. we promoted, and it did very well. Um, I, I, I think when you're traveling, carrying a lot of books can be heavy. I think that will be more uh, of the people that purchase uh, those types of things. But the books will still live on I because agree. you have to ha- you're going to have the books. Uh, kids love to read. Um, it will never go. I love to lay down and read a good book. Everybody yeah. does. Mm-hmm. But if you're traveling a lot, you can't carry a lot anymore because they charge you for carrying whatever you carry in now on the planes. I don't like the Kindle. It's not. This is yeah. cool. You sit back, yeah. sit down. Sit. Yeah. It's like smoking a pipe, except yeah. healthier. And for the naysayers yeah. out there <laughs> who are disagreeing with all this, I say, when we became a paperless society, yeah. we started using more paper we than ever before. Paper. So as we do away with books, yeah. we'll probably have we'll more have books more than books. we ever did Apple never went away. It right. just yeah. transformed we'll have more it. books, but again, it's a convenience thing more than anything. Or maybe the elite, just yeah. like certain art forms. So, well, pull I mean, me back to literacy and the impact of a closing bookstore has on literacy. Any thoughts? Yeah, it says something uh, to a community when a bookstore closes or when a library closes. Mm-hmm. But it says, is that important? You know, to the the what's going on in our community, and especially mm-hmm. in a town that uh, only had one. 
and it closes. Mm -hmm. What does that say? And one that was successful. That's mind-blowing because someone in corporate America decides that this community doesn't have a bookstore. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's a message in there that we need to be very careful about. In defense of Barnes & Noble, I do want to say that they have said that they are planning, they are mm -hmm. looking for an area to put in a superstore in the vicinity, but that that space wouldn't even become available for 18 months, the place mm -hmm. they're looking mm -hmm. at. for. So you figure at least two years before a store is open. And in two years' time of children that are growing up in a community that doesn't value purchasing books, I'm mm -hmm. concerned. Yes. You know? well, mm -hmm. And you know what's going to be also, also complicating everything? When to, as, a, as a writer, the thing I'm watching... Google is completely changing the idea of copyright. This ancient idea of copyright, which is how mm -hmm. novelists used to make money, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, is about to change That's because exactly they're right. buying libraries by the whole. And again, it's part of that's good or bad. We're going back mm -hmm. to the days of the bard. So maybe mm -hmm. it is good that, okay, I don't get as much for this, but now you want Tony Diaz to come to your city. So yeah. the books are there. You'll pay for the bard to come in person. So maybe it's going backwards. But it's this strange moment where the new technology, like you said, may just bring us back to the old. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Before we Systems run out of time, well. though, I do want, because we have the Houston Public Library right here, mm -hmm. first thought that I think people might be worried about, we see all these budget cuts going on and all that, are the libraries in danger? I mean, well, if a community loses its bookstore and then its libraries... Um, and they We're tell not, me you have 15 seconds to answer that, <laughs> so I apologize for that. The library is not uh, in danger, but like libraries all over the country, we are seeing a reduction in our budget. And we need to support the libraries. Mm -hmm. right and and you also That's take right. donations of books, correct? We do take donations of books through our friends organization. And online, your uh, HPL. Houston Public. HoustonPublicLibrary.org. Okay, there mm -hmm. you go. Thank, Thank you. you all for coming mm -hmm. in. We have Thank run you. out of time, yeah. as we often do. Yeah. Yeah. And now each week we invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Simply click on the local programs bar, pick Houston 8, and you can join our online community. Mm -hmm. You can read about the guests, learn more about the topic, share your thoughts and ideas, and even suggest questions we might ask during upcoming episodes. Remember, information posted on our website may be used on air, so keep that in mind when submitting. That does it for us tonight. Until next time, I'm Ernie Manus. Thank you for joining us, and have a great week.